All right, people, we know that nearly every sector of the societal pie is dominated by think tanks and corporate interests, leaving the truth distorted and the public confused on a whole host of topics. Well, one of the biggest areas of misinformation and ignorance is diet, health, and nutrition, where dishonest companies and their powerful lobbyists have made so much money selling us harmful and addictive garbage in recent decades that they've flooded the information stream with deceptive scientific studies, savvy marketing, and bought off the very regulatory agencies the public thinks they're being protected by. It's an unfortunate situation, and the main culprit at the heart of this quest for consumption clarity is sugar. And the real treat for us is having Dr. Richard Jacoby here to shed some light on the true harms of sugar and how we ended up in this situation. All information that he details in his excellent new book, Sugar Crush, which looks at nerve damage and its links to sugar, I definitely learned a lot, and if our conspiracy culture is going to be concerned with our subjugation to poisons and toxins, this is an area that can't be ignored. On top of being the author of a great new book, Dr. Jacoby is one of the country's leading peripheral nerve surgeons and co-founder of the Scottsdale Healthcare Wound Management Center, and the former president of both the Arizona Podiatry Association and the Association of Extremity Nerve Surgeons. An impressive resume to say the least. Let's dive into it. Dr. Jacoby, welcome to THC. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, man. Thanks so much for being here. The harmful effects of a high sugar diet is a subject I like to revisit when I find myself slipping. So I'm happy to be talking about it. And let me start with a question that also starts your book, because when thinking about the type of doctor that might write a book about the dangers of sugar, a podiatrist isn't the first type of doctor people might think of. So let me ask you, why a podiatrist? Well, we actually do get involved with sugar and its uh, man manifestations in the lower extremity with gangrene and amputations. And that's what my orientation was about 30 years ago, 25 years ago, when I formed the Scottsdale Healthcare Wound Care Center, which is a big problem with the population in the United States. So that was my orientation uh, in the sur from the surgical standpoint. But I morphed over to more of the biochemistry and trying to find out why we're having this epidemic. And that's what the nature of this book is on nerves and its damage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it ties into so many different illnesses, diseases and disorders, way more than I even thought before I read the book. And the big one, of course, is diabetes. Most people are aware that diabetes and pre-diabetes is on the rise and that it's directly related to sugar. But how bad is that problem, really? Well, it's really pandemic. It's all over the world now. At least 350 million people are affected by that disease process. So let's let's go back and just talk about diabetes and diabetic, diabetic neuropathy and define some terms. And this is what I tried to do in the book. Diabetes itself means, it's from a Greek word, means to siphon uh, urine that's sweet. That's basically what it means. Diabetes mellitus is the real term, mellitus meaning sweet. And in, in the old days, in the 1500s, physicians tasted the patient's urine, and if it was sweet, they made that diagnosis. Hmm. Thank God we have new technology <laughs> right. uh, to not have to do that on a daily basis. But it's really a simple process when you think about it. It's too much sugar. And only the rich in the past had access to sugar. It was a very expensive commodity. And in England in the 1600s, it cost about $1,000 a pound. So only the rich had diabetes and all the other neurodegenerative diseases that we'll talk about today. But now sugar is cheap in the form of high fructose corn syrup. It's in 80% of all the foods in the United States. And now everybody has the disease. So thanks to um, mass marketing, uh, we have an answer to our problem. We have sugar in everything. Yeah, it's definitely way out of whack. I guess close to 50% of adults might be seeing diabetes in their lifetime. Is that accurate? That seems like way too many. No, it's, it's totally accurate. Uh -huh. The Medicare population age 65 or older have 50% either metabolic syndrome and or diabetes. But they're subjected to a diet over the last 45 years that, relatively speaking, didn't have as much sugar. So I suspect that that number is going to climb exponentially because now, beginning in the 70s, we started to put high fructose corn syrup in the food supply. Now, industry will argue back against that, that notion that 
High fructose corn syrup is no different than a normal fructose, but I don't think it that is true. There is a difference the way they manufacture it, and I like the fact that you think there is a conspiracy because there is. Mm -hmm. Most of the organizations that scientists are involved with are funded by these companies. And of course, they're going to ask for an answer that supports their notion that their food is good. Now, here's a perfect example, and this just happened over the weekend. There is a gal by the name of Maureen Story, and she is the CEO of the Alliance for Potato Research and Education. Hmm. She has been impressive. <laughs> I, well, <laughs> let's just call her Mrs. Potato Head. All right. <laughs> and uh, she is um, she's an excellent scientist, no question about it. She's got great uh, um, credentials, and she used to work for the um, um, the, the beverage industry. She also worked for Kellogg. So now she's working for potatoes and l letting the world know that potatoes are the best thing since sliced bread. No pun intended there. <laughs> it's all sugar. And pot a potato is a vegetable for sure, but it is the most starchy vegetable and the one that we like the best in forms of potato chips and French fries. And that's what got into the school lunch program. Now, she was just, she just replaced uh, an excellent journalist by the name of Nina Teichholz, who wrote an excellent book, and you may know this book, The Big Fat Surprise. Mm -hmm. And she was appointed to this government agency, but there was so much pushback from the other members who are all industry related. They all threatened to quit if she got on to the, uh, to the committee. And why are they upset with her? because she has written an excellent book dispelling the notion that fat is bad, fat is good. But we have been educated into ignorance over the last 50 years or so that fat is bad, we should take a statin drug, cholesterol is bad, and that causes heart disease. Nothing could be further from the truth. Mm -hmm. So industry will do whatever they can to buy the influence through the research to make their point known. And there's really very few people out there that are supporting the private industry, the people, to understand what we should be eating. Hopefully my book does help in that regard. Right, yeah, it definitely did for me. And I do wanna get into that, what people should be eating, but to go back to the history just a little bit, I like that you have the example of the Native Americans in the book. and it kind of is a good case study for dietary change and what the data tells us. Tell us a little bit about the Native Americans as an example of the dangers of sugar. Yes. Well, I practice in Scottsdale, Arizona, and the reservation is a mere few blocks away in the Salt River Indian Reservation, and they have the highest rate of amputation in the world. Fifty percent of their adults go on to have amputation from diabetes. Which is interesting because when you look back in the 1800s, 1830s, when they were placed on reservations, they were hunter gatherers and they hunted buffalo and they ate meat. They did have some staples and, and the local tribes, but basically they were meat eaters and they were very lean because they had to be because they lived off the land. Once we put them on a reservation, we fed them wheat, lard and sugar. And now they are probably the largest people on the planet. Mm -hmm. It's very common for them to be 400 pounds, and they are essentially all diabetic. Diabetes is not a genetic disease, and that's what we were taught. Uh, just a segue to the American Indian, when I was first studying these, this problem, I was asked by the Surgeon General of Taiwan to go to their country to figure out why they were getting diabetes. And this was 1981, 82 area. And when I got there, essentially no one had diabetes there, but they noticed a few people that did. Now they're just like we are. But in the 1980s, they didn't. But I spent several weeks there, went all over the country, and uh, I did notice that their culture did not have sugar in it. They didn't have desserts. They didn't have anything that we would consider to be processed food. But in 1979, the first, fit, first fast food restaurant was opened. And two years later, 
they were wondering why they had diabetes. So it's a diet related, but not a genetic related. And and at one of the meetings that they had for me, they had a big banquet and they had people come in and the uh, native dancers from an island off the coast of Taiwan, which is called Luan, and they were endemic to the area and they dressed exactly like American Indians. They had headdresses and moccasins and bow and arrows, and they were endemic to that island. And I was struck by their their looks, and I thought they were genetically related to the American Indian. And indeed, subsequent testing has proven that they are. Yeah. So there's a group of people that did not, did not have diabetes that were endemic to their all their culture and their eating habits. Once you introduce the American processed food, then they become diabetic. And that's exactly what happened to the Salt River and the Pima Indians in Arizona. So yes, genetics do play a role, but it's the food. It's really very simple. It's sugar and specifically high fructose corn syrup, in my opinion. Mm. Well, so let's talk about fruit because I've been trying to offset my cravings for processed sugar and candy and desserts with fruit. But according to the book, I might not be doing enough there because fruits changed in the past couple of decades too, right? Absolutely. 40 years ago, a grapefruit, most people either put salt or sugar on the grapefruit because it was too tart. And the reason it was tart because that's what normal fruits are, fairly tart. But over the last 50 years, we've hybridized them, meaning that we've grown them to be sweeter and sweeter and sweeter because that's what people want. And now it's available every day at the local grocery store so we can eat fruit every day. But culturally and, and paleontology points out that we don't eat fruit. We only eat fruit when we want to gain weight, and it does a good job huh. because fruit, fructose, has a insulin response and we will put weight on and that's its job to put fat on your body. Wow. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of funny because I thought I was doing a healthy thing recently by blending up a shake in the morning and putting protein powder in it. And you know, it's mostly fruit with a little bit of vegetables, but I've been noticing I'm gaining weight even more so than when I had a pretty fast food related diet. And I wondered why, but I mean, I guess all the sugar and the protein powder is kind of, uh, might be responsible for that, even though I thought I was doing a healthy thing. Well, that's what most people think, because that's what we were taught to do. The food pyramid is that instrument that educates us what to eat and right. fruits and vegetables. And the grains are on the bottom of that pyramid and they are loaded up with sugar. The only way you can gain weight is to have an insulin response and only carbohydrates and sugar will produce that. When you eat fat or meat, Although it has a little bit of insulin response, it's negligible, so we're not going to store that energy as fat. So to eat fat is to get thin. Um, Mark Hyman actually just came out with a book with that title, uh, Eat Fat, Get Thin. Hmm. And it seems to be the absolute opposite of what we were taught. Um, and as you notice in my book, I say we were educated into ignorance by the food pyramid, by the USDA, which is really nothing more than farmers influencing the federal government to sell more of their food. Now, you can't blame them, but they're getting away with it, and we have to have transparency. When you talk about conspiracy theories, this is probably the biggest conspiracy theory in America today. I think it's why Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump are way up there in the polls, because America knows they've been had, and they're digging into it. There's something rotten in Denmark, and it starts with the food. Mm -hmm. One of the um, points I have in my new book that I'm writing is a question I always had, and I'll start with this question. Back in the 50s, there was a gentleman by the name of Willie Sutton, and he liked to rob banks for a living, and he was in and out of prison. And one day somebody asked him, I said, Willie, why do you rob banks? And the answer was because that's where the money is. <laughs> so so it's a real simple answer. And I, so I asked the question to myself, why do politicians go to Iowa? And the answer is that's where the money is. 
And you would think, Iowa, how could there be any money in Iowa? Well, right. that's where the farm bill starts. The farm bill is one trillion dollars, not a billion, a trillion dollars. And the candidates go to Iowa and if they're going to support the farm bill, they get the money. If they don't, they, they're not supported. And Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump are not supported by the farm bill, mm. but the rest of the candidates are. So oh. you just follow the money stream. It goes down the farm bill. That trillion dollars goes to the National Institute of Health. And that's where the grants are given to support or disprove that sugar is good or bad. And then it goes to the school lunch program. It goes to the food for peace. It goes to many, many different agencies, including the SNAP program, which is the food stamp program. And it goes on and on and on. So you can buy a lot of influence with a trillion dollars. Mm, wow. Yeah. I wanted to talk about uh, more of those issues in depth. But when you start hearing about the dangers of sugar and getting in the mindset that it's more of a toxin rather than something we should consider a food group. I mean, what the hell is the FDA doing? The false sense of safety that they give. I mean, it's almost criminal at this point. Well, I think you're absolutely right. It is criminal because we have these agencies to protect us, and they obviously have been bought. Now, let's look at the cholesterol issue. I mean, we all know that cholesterol is bad for your heart, correct? How do we know that? Because we were taught that. Right. And it's absolutely not true. 50% of the people who are admitted to a hospital do have high cholesterol. The other 50% have low cholesterol. It has nothing to do with heart attacks. But two-thirds of those patients have either metabolic syndrome and or diabetes. It's sugar that's causing the massive uh, coronary vascular disease in our country. Recently, uh, Scalia, Judge Scalia, died of a massive heart coronary, and he was a diabetic. And I was just writing one of my new chapters for the new book, which was Dead is a bad symptom. Hmm. And what I mean by that is cardiac arrest is sudden and may not have any symptoms prior to it that are at least are related to the disease process. But if you look at sugar as a poison, you're being slowly poisoned to death. And the reason is, is because it is ruining your B vitamins and thiamine in particular. And it's interesting that arsenic, also a poison, that you can die slowly from is sweet. That's why it was the poison of choice in the early 1900s because it wasn't detectable and people would keep eating the sweet, nice poison. Well, that's what I think our diet is, sweet, nice poison in the form of high fructose corn syrup affecting the same um, biochemical pathways as arsenic. So it's a huge problem. My book talks about the effects of sugar on nerves and the biochemistry of nerve compression. Mm -hmm. So, when I first started to write the book, that was the that was the um, the theme of the book. But as I got into it, I realized I had to dispel this um, fat evil companion to sugar. Fat is good as long as it's grass fed and it's uh, omega three versus omega six, which is a whole other chapter in the book. Um, so it's all interrelated. Mm -hmm. So one doctor is telling you one thing, um, have your cholesterol checked and put you on a statin drug. And then I come along and say, well, your peripheral neuropathy is caused by sugar and you shouldn't be on a statin drug because you shouldn't be eating sugar. You should be eating more fat. Now, what could be more confusing than that statement? <laughs> Right. And that cholesterol myth is so pervasive. I know, I mean, I'm 30 years old. My parents are both getting up there in age and they're worrying about their health more. And I hear them repeating those cholesterol myth type things. And, you know, you try to combat it as best you can. But that generation in particular has really just gotten a, a, a raw deal in terms of true dietary nutritional information. And the cholesterol thing gets pretty severe because I've heard you say that it actually reduces IQ, which uh, some people might be pretty surprised by. Well, I, I, I do a little political joke when I'm giving lectures, and it's true. The higher your IQ, the higher your cholesterol. The lower your IQ, the lower your cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what group I'm talking to. But I say if this continues, then everybody will be voting for Obama.
<laughs> That's funny. It gets, uh, that, it gets about 50% laugh, depending <laughs> on. But the point is, cholesterol is necessary for brain function. And depriving the brain and or the heart, cholesterol is, is causing damage. It's a $29 billion a year drug. Mm-hmm. Now, they can influence who writes the papers. Now, if I went to NIH and said, I'm going to write a paper on the evils of cholesterol and statin drugs, they would not fund me. Or if they did fund me, it wouldn't get printed. These agencies are dominated by private industry, right. pure and simple. Mm. And uh, another interesting thing, because the book is largely about nerve damage related to sugar, and some of the deeper stuff is a bit over my head, but one example that is really interesting is carpal tunnel syndrome. Talk to us about that and how it might might have more to do with sugar than keyboards necessarily. Well, that's, that's one of the issues that got, got me started in this correlation between carpal tunnel and peripheral neuropathy and the other neurodegenerative diseases. I train with Lee Dellen, who's a professor of neurosurgery and plastic surgery at Johns Hopkins, and he's the one that influenced me many years back on this subject. Carpal tunnel of the wrist, and a lot of your listeners probably know of this disease, but it's the median nerve at the wrist, and it operates the index finger and the thumb. And it starts with some numbness and tingling, and eventually you lost motor, lose motor function. And the surgery is very effective to cut the ligament to allow the nerve to be uncompressed uh, or decompressed. But when I was talking to Lee Dillon uh, from Hopkins about this, and he was writing papers back in the 70s and 80s on this subject, and the prevailing wisdom is the typewriter was being phased out and the computer keyboard was coming in in about the early 70s. What they thought was that the prevalence of the keyboard was causing the nerve compression. It was strictly a mechanical issue. But unbeknownst to them, in 1974, high fructose corn syrup was introduced into the diet, and that Coke that was sitting next to the keyboard was probably had more influence on the nerve compression than the mechanics. The mechanics of a typewriter are magnitudes higher than a computer keyboard. Mm -hmm. But the magnitude of sugar going into the system is, is what I think is the is the problem. Prior to 1960, there were only 12 recorded cases in the literature on carpal tunnel. Today, last year, there were 500,000 carpal tunnel surgeries done. Jeez. <laughs> I think it's I think it's the diet. Yeah. I, I that makes I, so I mean, much sense. Of course. So then so then I was on a on a quest to try to figure this out. So I discussed this with Dr. Dellen 15 years ago, and he says, well, why don't you figure it out? I said, well, I'll start reading the literature that I never read. Mm-hmm. And I found Dr. John Cook, who is a vascular biologist at Stanford and also a cardiologist, and he was working on a molecule called asymmetric dimethylarginine. Big word, but bottom line, what it is, it blocks the blood supply to the nerve. I thought that interesting, so I text him about 10 years ago, and he called me on the phone the same day he got the email. And he said, I think you have something, come up here, we'll look at it. So I tested lots of my patients with that molecule that he was studying, and we found correlations not only between carpal tunnel, diabetic neuropathy, but MS, ALS, and lots of different neurodegenerative diseases. So that brought me to the thought that all these diseases are the same. The biochemistry is the same on any patient who is eating a lot of sugar, and it causes nerve compression. Now, usually first manifest in the foot. Then I went back through a history of patients, many, many, many patients, and they all had subtle symptoms, migraine headaches, gallbladder disease, a perfect example. And I was subjected to that one as my myself. Mm-hmm. My mother had her gallbladder out. I had my gallbladder out. And I was thinking, how could there be a connection between gallbladder and nerve damage? We're taught not to eat fat. 
That's what a gallbladder disease is. Mm. It's really absolutely the opposite. You have to stop eating sugar. You need fat. So the nerve, I looked at all these different nerves in the body from ALS to Alzheimer, which absolutely is sugar. And my speculation is that autism is as well. They're all different nerves. They all have an end organ that appears to be different. The toe is a mechanical receptor. The eye is a photoreceptor. And the one that really interests me was autism. Because the prevalence of autism in 19, or excuse me, 2000, was about 16 births per 10,000. Last year was one in 50. Now that's an epidemic. Right. That's that's unbelievable. And now uh, Alzheimer's, which I think is just a different nerve. Alzheimer's is is um, the olfactory nerve, the sense of smell. Most people think Alzheimer's is be is loss of memory, which it is, but the early symptom is loss of smell because the olfactory nerve is that nerve that for our nose. So you're gradually getting nerve compression, at least this is my theory, and then gradually you lose your memory. And it's all due to sugar. Um, there's a great book, David Perlmutter, who's a neurologist, that wrote Grain brain, and now he has a new one, Brain Maker, and he comes to that conclusion as well. But my book is different in the sense that I'm linking all the nerves to the same process. It's just the end organ is, is different, so the symptoms are different. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what happens with uh, autism. Uh, so, I mean, that's a, another big subject, but I think um, it needs to be fully explored because one in 50 births is an alarming number. It is. And 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 it's not their fault. Alzheimer's, yes, maybe you're eating a lot of sugar, you know, you know you're doing it and that's the end end damage self-inflicted to some degree, but a lot of it is inflicted not knowing. But for a kid born into autistic spectrum disorder, that's a lifelong disability that is not their fault and allow this food to be in our diets is is criminal as you say right and the autism link is a pretty big bombshell because being a conspiracy show autism everybody knows it's on the rise the typical scapegoat is vaccines because people try to think of you know what happens around those years where people get autism and that's kind of the thing people go to but when you learn about sugar and you think of it as a poison it gets really dark and sad to think that parents have a healthy child and are slowly poisoning their own kids and destroying their cognitive function. I mean, there's really no other way to put it if that is the link. Well, well I think what, um, what I've learned on the autism spectrum disorder, it's really a preconception problem. The parents are eating a lot of sugar. Most, ah. most uh, pregnancies in the United States um, are not or they don't happen under a strict diet. They um, happen with most likely a six pack of beer and a pizza. <laughs> That's the planning. Jeez. I have a friend who's a um, uh, fertility specialist, ob Jin, especially. He has his patients who want to conceive, who can't go on a very strict diet, a very clean diet. And he has over 900 births and not one of them has autistic spectrum disorder. Wow. And yes. So I think it is a preconception problem. It's a genetic problem from both the male and the female. There's a uh, neuro um, neurologic center in, in Arizona called Barrows, and, and there's a neurogeneticist there um, who feels the same as I do. And it causes a epigenetic problem, and it I believe, changes the genes that causes a protein not to be um, put down at a specific day after conception. Mm. And that protein is at the base of the brain, and it causes a compression of the hypoglossal nerve, and that's the nerve that innervates the tongue for speech. And that is the first symptom of autistic spectrum disorder. 
So I think it's a nerve compression, secondary to high fructose corn syrup. Now back to the vaccine, because it's thought that mercury might be implicated in that. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly, high fructose corn syrup is made with mercury as a catalyst for uh, sodium hydroxide. That's how the corn is separated from the sugars. Wow. So mercury is a big part of the high fructose corn syrup mechanism. Now, in the United States, they're starting to to um, phase that mercury process out, but it was used in the food, and there's some studies that have shown that a third of that 80% of high fructose corn syrup that is in all foods has mercury in it. Mercury is a neurotoxin, so it could be the other link. Wow, man, yeah, maybe we had the chemical right, but just the delivery method was off. Um, so you mentioned. Dr. Dellen, and you do write about this leading nerve surgeon in the book, and you mentioned a conversation you had with him where he asks, why do you podiatrists cut out the nerves of people's feet? And you replied that it's just kind of what we do. And it highlights something that I think is really important, and it's applicable to so many different areas, but the public assumes that because someone has a certain degree or a credential, that they're an expert and an authority, but if their training or information is incorrect or tainted by any of the millions of factors out there, big business in particular, their expertise kind of becomes a lot less valuable. And this is something that we see as a huge problem in the medical world, isn't it? Uh, totally. And Dr. Dillon, who's a plastic surgeon by training, asked me that question because he's, I mean, he's the world's leading peripheral neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. And I did not know that fact because we were taught that as a fact. So I never read the original paper by Thomas Morton, which was in the 1800s. He read the original paper because he didn't know the subject, quote unquote, as well as I did. So he did original primary research which there's a difference being told something and learning it from a different point of view. Mm -hmm. And that was an epiphany for me because I was embarrassed. I never read the, the original paper. And to compound that, Thomas Morton uh, practiced it in Philadelphia at the Pennsylvania Hospital, the exact hospital that I trained at. And I didn't know that fact. Now, he was there in the 1800s. So I was a few years later, but I never met him. Uh, but he's the first one to do that procedure and he essentially just cut out he actually cut out the bone the nerve just about anything in the area that hurt and that does work you know i'm, I'm happy he wasn't treating headaches he would have done the same thing <laughs> so that's how medicine evolved by trial and error so the science behind it um is passed on from one generation to the next we need a whole fresh new approach but now the government's involved they do the training. They tell us what are facts. And that science is very, very suspect. So you have to read the, the um, bibliography. you got to know who funded the study and what the conclusions were. Now, for instance, this Maureen story that I just started to talk about in the beginning of this, mm -hmm. she's the um, I'm an excellent scientist. There's no question about it. But she worked for Kellogg then the beverage industry, and now for the Potato Research and Education, the Alliance, if you can imagine that. And she, I looked up some of her papers. One of the papers was she compared the BMI, the um, uh, metabolic index, on kids and their consumption of sugary drinks. And it was a really well-done paper. And when, you know what her conclusion was? No correlation. Wow. Amazing, huh? No, so kids could eat all, drink all the sugary drinks they want, and they would not get fat. That is absolutely ridiculous. Right. But that a fact that will be taught and is taught, and will go to Congress as one of the basics for why we have the food pyramid. There's this Bible that they use. It's called the uh, uh, Nutrition Evidence Library. I find that rather interesting title. So think of it, Nutrition Evidence Library. Mm -hmm. Only those evidence that support your hypothesis go in that. Anything to the contrary doesn't. So it's kind of like the Bible, <laughs> you know, King James Version or whatever. Whatever your religion is, you don't want any information that's going to contradict your your premise. Right. So it never gets into the Bible. And, of course, you believe the Bible. That's your faith. 
and you and that's what Congress uses. So their faith and a reliance is that fat is bad and cholesterol is the enemy and needs to be stamped out. And the pharmaceutical companies took in $29 billion last year doing a great job of getting America on statin drugs. Mm. So they did it. <laughs> and um, But I think Bernie and Donald uh, think there's something rotten out there, and, I th and they're absolutely right. Now, if we can get into the solution to the problem, I think the solution to the problem is really just transparency, labeling. Right. Industry should not dictate what is on the label. If they were proud of genetically modified foods, which is another part of this as equation, then why would you not want to put it on the label? Exactly. I would be proud of it. This food contains genetically modified organisms, and we're going to charge you more for it because it's the greatest thing ever for your health. <laughs> True. Why don't they say that? They don't want you to know it because they know it's absolutely not true. Mm -hmm. Man, so food labels, of course, they're super confusing and hard to read today because we don't have that transparency. Do you have any tips or advice for better understanding the current food labels? I do, because patients ask me all the time, uh, what should I eat? And I say, it's very simple. If it tastes good, don't eat it. <laughs> and I'm being facetious. But what I mean is, unless you read the label, if it tastes good, it probably has sugar in it. So let's, what's the easiest way to read a label? Not the added sugar or anything else. Just look at the total carbohydrates. Divide by four, and that's how many teaspoons of sugar will be in that food. Like a bagel has about 48 grams of carbohydrates. That's 12 teaspoons of sugar equivalent. Hmm. That's a lot of sugar. Yeah. When maybe your max for the whole day should be six teaspoons. So you have 12 right there. Well, a bagel it can't that can't do do that much damage. But it'll take you about two hours jumping on a trampoline to burn up that energy. One bagel with nothing on it. Is that worth it? I don't think so. No. And they do They do taste great, though. Right. I will give it that. That's the problem is I could probably go without sugar, but then if we include carbohydrates and pasta and cereal, then it gets really limiting. And maybe you can break this down a bit further and tell us what you would eat in, say, a three-day period because a lot of people need some variety and the same thing every day gets a bit boring. What does a good like three-day diet look like to you? Well, to me, you have to break that sugar habit in any form. So how do you do that? you got to put fat back in your diet. Once you put fat back in, you won't be hungry. I did because I was a sugar hog, not knowing it. Yet, if you looked at me, you say that I wasn't. But I, I thought, well, I'll just not eat any bread, pasta, or anything else for a two-week period. Extremely difficult to do because you go into a depression, you're constantly hungry. So what I did... Since I like coffee, I put butter in my coffee. Mm -hmm. That's the easiest thing to do if you like coffee and if you like butter. It has to be grass-fed butter. And just a teaspoon or so, and instantly you're not hungry. Hmm. You'll have tremendous energy, and if you're overweight, you're going to lose a pound a day. Wow. So my diet will it really kind of is two cups of coffee in the morning with butter. Maybe I'll have lunch. If I do, it's going to be a salad and really not much. And dinner will be a steak or pork chop or something like that. Maybe some green vegetables. But that's pretty much it. Hmm. But I'm not hungry. And you'll lose weight. So once you lose weight, then you require less food and your energy at levels will go up. So you're going to stay pretty thin. The biggest problem with eating a fat-based diet, you will start to lose too much weight, and then you have to start to think, oh, what can I eat to gain some weight? And the answer is eat some fruit, um, eat a potato, that'll do it, um, but then you'll start to get hungry again. So you need good fats in your diet, like coconut oil is a perfect one. That's a perfect fat. Olive oil is good. Uh, avocados are good. But I love butter, so I I like to put butter in my coffee and that's to me that's the easiest thing to do yeah i've been using a whole lot of butter grass-fed of course when i make a steak also grass-fed 
Um, but it's just getting a variety because I've had so many steaks. I'm like, huh, I got to get something else in here. But, you know, I'm not even really a coffee drinker because I just don't crave it. And it isn't typically considered necessarily good for you. But the grass fed butter in the diet trend is getting more and more popular. I mean, funny enough, I think the last health related show I did was with Dave Asprey about a year ago or so talking about the whole bulletproof coffee thing. But if you're not really a coffee drinker, is it better to just keep it out of your diet or is are these benefits such a net positive that it should be considered regardless? I'm thinking it's a net positive. Now, the Tibetans use a tea mixture with uh, uh, yak butter. If you have a yak around, that would be, <laughs> I don't know what that tastes like. But basically, it, the, the theory is you need you need fats. The body operates on fat. Never, It doesn't operate on sugar. Mm -hmm. And we've been taught that it does. It absolutely does not. Uh, carbohydrate is not a essential nutrient. I'll repeat that. It's not. And if you never had another carb in your life, you would you would be healthier and healthier. That, that's the ketogenic diet. Right. And the ketogen. Right. So that's what it. So that's the cancer's link. Looking back, um, Otto Warburg got the Nobel Prize in 1933 for his work on uh, what do cancer cells eat. And they eat fructose. They eat sugar. And when you deprive them of sugar, they produce ketones, and ketones will kill cancer cells. That's so interesting. Now, why don't we know that? It's 1933. God. So we give them chemotherapy, give them Ensure to keep their weight up, which is really nothing but sugar in the hospital. And then we do PET scans to see if this cancer has come back, because the PET scan is really measuring the amount of sugars being used in the cell at the mitochondrial level. So that's kind of silly. So I tell my patients, it's like you have roaches in the kitchen. Yes. And you spray the roaches with Raid, but never clean up the sugar and go back six months later. Do you think the roaches will be back? <laughs> Absolutely. That's cancer. Yeah, I thought but that was a great analogy. Not, yeah. That's, I mean, that's not my field, but my field is nerves and peripheral neuropathy. But when I did the research for this book, I came up with all these things that are ingrained in my mind as to be truths, which are absolutely just anecdotal evidence that's been passed down over the years. And it's it's a shame. Can you imagine going forward? Here's a typical woman in her 40s or 50s. She has breast cancer caused by sugar. And she's got a kid with autistic spectrum disorder and one of her parents as Alzheimer's. Oh. How's that for a scenario? Wow. That's America. God, man. It is. It is. Those are the, the big things that people are getting. And when you put it like that, it can all be affecting one family. And it's as simple as cutting sugar out of the diet. I mean, you have you talk about in the book that you've had to amputate legs before. You deal with that, amputating feet and limbs. And that is how bad the addiction is. I mean, if you had a relative that was so addicted to cocaine or marijuana or alcohol that they were getting limbs removed. Of course, alcohol is related to sugar too, but you would be like, man, you got a serious problem, but we just kind of allow people to be addicted to sugar and it's not treated nearly as seriously. No, it's not. But I think, you know, our culture is um, mass media culture. Very few people read books and if they do, they they um, tend to read novels. So this book is not a novel. My next one, I think I'm, it, we're trying to put it more over to the conspiracy that people like conspiracies, mm -hmm. which is probably the biggest one going. Uh, how did it happen? My agent in New York, his name is Al Zuckerman. When I wrote this book, he's, I, I call him Mr. Big because he's the agent to Stephen King, Stephen Hawking's, just about any any big writer and I was amazed that he took my book but he was he was really behind the project and he wants my new book to be very similar to Michael Lewis's book which is the big short he's the agent for Michael Lewis mm. and he said you got he says you got to humanize this more this you have too much science in the book <laughs> so I'm going to try to write it that way when it's being rewritten as we speak and um it is the big short that most people don't understand uh, mortgage derivatives, but they do understand the damage that it caused yeah. by the 
the um, misinformation. And there can't be any more misinformation than food. We are taught that medicine is going to correct everything. Absolutely not true. This diabetes medicine myth is ridiculous. All these medicines do are allow us to eat more sugar. Every one of the medicines, even insulin. Yeah. Um, type 1, if you're born without a pancreas, yeah, you're going to die unless you have insulin. Everything else is type 2. It's self-induced. And the first thing you do is stop the sugar. I mean completely. But they don't. They give them metformin, glipizide, every conceivable drug you can think of. Now, the new one is... Uh, kidney drugs to pump the sugar out of your urine so you can eat more sugar. That's really what it is. Mm. And we're paying for it through our Medicare, which is broke. Our social security system is broke. Right. And it's all because of this misinformation. That's true. Well, Doc, that pretty much brings us to the end of the line. I very much appreciate you being here. A lot of doctors and nutritionists kind of avoid my request because to be on a show that is uh, comfortable being called a conspiracy show, they sometimes opt out and instead go on uh, you know, the health and diet theme programs, which in my opinion is kind of just preaching to the choir. I think the people who don't have diet and nutrition on their radar, those are the ones that need to be reached. So hopefully we're doing some good stuff because if people are going to start screaming about chemtrails and vaccines, but yet they're drinking soda and eating fast food, I mean, they're kind of missing <laughs> a, a crucial element of damage is being done to them. So I do appreciate it. Big thanks. And uh, maybe before we go, you could remind people about the book, where to get it and anything else you might want them to know to follow up on you and your work. Well, I have a website, Sugar Crush, the book. Uh, it just came out in paperback form about a month ago and Amazon picked it as number one new release. Barnes and Noble has it. And most of the private bookstores have it as well. Awesome. Well, you're doing a noble thing. Thanks again. And I hope some of us have been scared straight today. Yeah. Keep doing what you do out there. I appreciate being on your show. You're doing a great job. Thanks. Boom, people. Dr. Richard P. Jacoby, really intelligent and accomplished guy. We all know sugar is bad. I don't think we're shocking anybody here, but I think the way Dr. Jacoby reframes the situation could cause a few aha moments out there. I know I loved the little history lessons. I loved the Native American data. The little realization that neither fruit nor wheat are the same as they used to be. Also, to read about these links to bad allergies and restless leg syndrome, these are the two biggest ongoing issues for me. I realize they are minor compared to a lot of people, so I've just learned to live with them. But this show kind of woke me up that maybe my diet is responsible for these things and it isn't just part of life that, you know, you got to have something wrong with you. And the truth is, I'm not going to just be able to cut back a little here, skip a day there. It's got to be a real life change. We all got to realize that because when Dr. Jacoby laid out the scenario of a person who's diabetic, who has a kid on the autism scale, and a parent with Alzheimer's, and this can all be linked to sugar, I mean, you got to be fucking kidding me, guys, you know? But the links to my specific semi-conditions really did help. If you have allergies, before you take in carbs or sugar, think about how annoying your allergies are and imagine that not eating that cupcake or drinking that Coke would be more effective than just taking a Benadryl later or whatever. That's been really helping me with the struggle this week. But a lot of people have this mindset, I know I've been guilty of it, where we think, oh, we'll stop when it becomes a problem. I can just eat junk food for now or smoke cigarettes for now, but as soon as any real red flags go up, I'll just stop. But that is such a mind game, because if you don't have the willpower to quit now, why would you have it then? It's better to spend a couple of months going through a major overhaul of slipping up here and there, the ebb and flow of breaking an addiction, going through all of that, but eventually finding a balance before anything goes seriously wrong. What's the point of eating right if you're already kind of broken and can't truly experience the benefits of doing it right? And we got to think about the younger generations, too. I mean, we got to teach our kids better habits. Every kid's going to have some sugar. Indulgences are a fun part of life. You don't have to tell me twice. But let them know, hey, this is really, really bad for you. And if you want to grow up big and strong, you need to limit this as much as you can. Is that so bad? How many parents have actually just said that to their kids and explained it? 
Talk to your kid like they're a little person. They're capable of understanding. It's not right to let them just form these bad habits and have to figure it out later or just say no because you said so. We went over the education conspiracy. We went over the capability of young kids. Make them wiser. Don't make them wander around in ignorance. There's no reason. But it is something most Americans are going to struggle with. I spent two weeks in Europe, two weeks in Armenia. Yeah, they do not have the same problems we have. I grew up in the American Midwest in the 90s. Is there any better epicenter for forming bad dietary habits? But it's hard. So what? I think that's another problem in life at this point, is that most of us don't accomplish hard tasks enough. And I'm not talking about mastering Fallout 4. I'm talking about learning to work on your own car, building something from scratch, cooking restaurant-quality dishes, writing a book. Let's face it, most of our jobs suck, but they are easy. Then we come home day after day and just veg out until it starts again. Is that going to be your legacy? Keeping life easy, staying soft, and going quietly into the night? <laughs> but a lot of major accomplishments are hard. I hear so many people say, oh, well, I, I just have no musical ability. Well, in the 20 or more years you've been on this planet, how many hours have you dedicated to a musical instrument to say that you have no musical ability? People say, oh, I'm a terrible artist. How many hours have you sat down learning to do art? How many courses on drawing fundamentals have you taken? Probably none. So all these people use these excuses, oh, I'm just not talented in that area. Well, Michael Jordan didn't even make his fucking high school basketball team. It isn't about natural born talent all the time. In fact, most of the time, I think it's not. It's about hard work. And we just don't do that. We've gone soft. In the Plus show, I had mentioned Tim Ferriss and some of these efficiency, biohacking, and human optimization guys. They're really inspiring and motivating to me. Something they've talked about is before you get out of the shower in the morning, turn the water to the coldest temperature for the last 30 seconds or a minute before you get out. The science seems to show that it has a huge cognitive benefit. It really gets your blood flowing, gets your energy levels up, all that good stuff. So I've been doing it for the past month or so, and it really does work. It sounds a bit goofy, but when you think about it, your whole day is going to seem so easy by comparison. Because honestly, what about a typical humdrum American life is going to be more difficult than taking freezing cold water on your naked body for 45 seconds? Almost nothing, right? So it puts you in a weird mind state of, I'm a bad motherfucker, and I'm ready to rear naked choke the hell out of this day. And all you did was turn a knob. It's a nice little hack. And it really, really does suck when it's happening, but for the next eight hours, you're probably going to feel great. It's a solid trade-off. I'd say give it a try. Either way, I hope this show helped the ones who do struggle with diet. I know I get a lot of shit for not carrying triple X large shirts with conspiracies. Once a week, at least, someone will complain. But the truth is, firstly, to give me shit for that suggests that all these other brands have triple X sizes, and that is just not true. So I don't know why people are that surprised when I don't. And I know there can be several reasons why someone might need a triple X shirt, but I'm willing to bet that 9 out of the 10 of those people don't have their diet dialed in correctly. Or they don't really exercise. Or maybe they over-over-exercise, in which case, you know, slow down, buddy. Anyway, but instead of thinking about some of those things and looking internally, they complain to me. I've gotten accused of discrimination over this, but honestly, we live in a world of small, medium, large, extra large. And I'll give you extra, extra large as a buffer. But if you need a shirt that is an extra, extra, extra large to cover your body, you really need to take a good internal look at why you are so far off the mark instead of whining about a clothing brand that doesn't cater to what really is an enormous size. Not to be rude, enormous is just another word for extra, extra, extra large, right? But again, we've gone soft physically, mentally, emotionally, and I think we need to withstand some cold showers, hear some harsh words, and face some uncomfortable truths. Otherwise, we just don't get better. 
I also thought some of the added facts about diabetes were interesting. The good doctor had mentioned that it's not hereditary, it's dietary. And when you think about it, of course the two get mixed up because our dietary habits are formed in the family. So the quote-unquote disease isn't hereditary, but the mechanism that causes it certainly is. And think about that. Think about how you look and what sort of message that sends to your own kids and family. It's important, but culturally, we've nerfed all of our language, and especially when it comes to weight and diet. Would anyone be surprised if there were meetings a few years ago in the Pepsi, Hershey's, and McDonald's boardrooms where they said, look, people are getting super fat, and it's because of our foods, and the data shows that jokes, comments, and social commentary on obesity are on the rise. This is bad for business. We need to really push this new term, fat shaming and really create this culture of safe spaces and push back against those criticisms as prejudice. You know what I'm saying? I could see that meeting taking place dozens and dozens of times. So let's lose all that and have those difficult conversations. You get the idea. If you have a problem with diet, you know it. And you need to toughen up and change it. Are you going to be so weak that you're beaten by cupcakes, pizza, and cola? Nah, otherwise, what's the point? Well, guys, if you want to hear the second hour of my talk with Dr. Jacoby and all the great guests on THC, sign up for the Plus membership at thehiresidechatsplus.com. And that's going to be it for me. I've done what I can. And today it's your move, dear listeners. Your fucking move. No one.